The following is a presentation of the ILR School at Cornell University. ILR, advancing the world of work. Good afternoon and welcome to ILR Online. I'm here today with Professor Rosemary Bott, who is an um, ILR school uh, professor of human resource studies and also does a lot of work with industry performance. So she's perfect today to talk about what's going on in the aftermath of the Verizon uh, strike. The contracts are voted, uh, will be voted on this coming week. Um, I think all the the tallies will be in by 1 o'clock next Friday. So today, Professor Bott is going to unpack the proposals uh, that voters are working on. Um, as the Alice Hansen Cook professor at Cornell University, she's spent much of uh, her research time during the past two decades focused on industry performance and has done a great deal of uh, work in the service industry. So is going to answer some questions that tell us what the, the contract provides for workers, um, what the significance of this win for workers is, um, and how things stand with this um, in terms of the rights of workers more broadly across the United States, and also what it means for Verizon. And I think you're going to find some surprising answers to the questions I'll ask. So let's start, Professor, with what the contract provides. Well, first of all, thank you, Mary, for um, uh, inviting me to be here, and I'm really thrilled to do so because um, I really have looked at the telecommunications industry over the last 20 years, and I care deeply about its development and the workers um, who work so hard to provide us with the service they do. Um, so I look at the contract, and it's kind of uh, useful to boil it down into about four areas that have been uh, have seen improvements. So first of all um, is some basics on, on the wages um, that the uh, union negotiated. And here we see quite decent increases of about 11 percent over the four years, which is two and a half to three percent a year. And if you think about that for non-union workers who rarely get a pay raise, this is, this is quite uh, a, a very good uh, increase. Um, and then in addition, they're getting a, a signing bonus of about $1,000 each, so when the contract is, is, um, is concluded. Um, the second is that the company provided um, proposals to cut back the pension uh, plan and the disability and um, accident insurance. And this is again where the union was able to push back and say no. The union has what is called a defined benefit pension plan, which is very important. It's a, um, you know, there are many uh, um, workers that ha don't no longer have that. They have a 401k. So this is very important to uh, preserve. And they were able to get some increases uh, from the company to contributions to that plan. So that's on stable footing. More importantly, the third area that is critical is job security. So just to give you a little background, the union workforce, the key workforce in telecoms is divided into two parts. So one uh, side of the company is in customer service and sales. So those are the call center workers that we interact with all the time when we want to change our service. That's primarily a female dominated workforce. And then on the other side are the technicians who maintain and install and repair the infrastructure for the telecom uh, industry. And so, and that is primarily a male-dominated workforce, although they've changed. They've been uh, kind of increasingly um, uh, including more women, for example, in the tech force. So key to this is that the company uh, was going to outsource and offshore um, many call center jobs and was going to close, I think, five centers, which would have been devastating for the women. And these jobs would have been sent to Mexico or Philippines or wherever. They prevented that from happening, and in fact, they're adding 1,300 new call center jobs. So that's, that's a huge success. On the tech side, the company had proposed to increase contracting out of that technician work and also to require a, a kind of forced transfer that the union techs would have to be forced to take jobs across states. 
And so think about the instability possibly created. You may have to give up your job if you have to transfer across a state. And they were able to push back on these proposals, so they're no longer uh, on the table. And in addition, they negotiated 25% uh, more jobs in the maintenance uh, in New York State. So that job security is huge, particularly in this period when, as you probably know, um, uh, many companies are contracting out work and they're using more independent contractors. And so workers' jobs are becoming more uncertain and stable. And this contract says no. Um, then the fourth piece is that there's a new contract for a Verizon wireless workers. Now this is an historic first, right? Because the union since the 1980s has tried to organize the wireless workers ever since wireless came into existence. And the company has been very fierce in um, preventing unionization. So this is a breakthrough. This is a historic breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the union was able to negotiate more than what we call a first contract. So normally a first contract you would get basic union rights like arbitration, grievance, just cause for dismissal, uh, collective bargaining. But in addition, the union was able to negotiate job security for those workers. So there's a limit on contracting out. Um, the workers also get to shift some of the pay that was at risk to now guaranteed pay. Okay, so now for low wage workers, they get a guaranteed income rather than having some of their pay be on commission. So these are all fabulous um, gains. Major victories for really the workers. Really impressive. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly uh, yeah. impressive. And, and hugely significant given the context of what's going on in the rest of the world and in this nation. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we welcome your questions and um, we'll start answering them in probably about uh, 10 minutes. Um, but before we go to the questions, um, Professor Bott, would you talk about you know, the significance this holds for workers more broadly and for unions, these, these victories by the Verizon workers? Yeah, I think that's really interesting because it's useful to put this into context, right? So here we have an unusually long strike in this day and age, uh, six weeks, and it not only the union, and it included both the CWA and the IBEW, they had to work together. They were successful in mobilizing, they were successful in getting out and um, going to headquarters and making uh, this a very visible strike. And it's a it gives kind of inspiration to other unions to take this risk when they haven't been uh, willing to do so or they've been, you know, worried about job loss. And it's, it's also, uh, we should put this in the context of a recent uh, NLRB decision in which um, the NLRB has kind of backed off the um, striker replacement um, provisions that were in the PATCO uh, decision uh, back in the Reagan era. And so companies will have to prove why they feel they can use uh, strike replacement workers in the future. So this is provides inspiration to unions to say we can be more assertive, we can mobilize uh, effectively. We've seen it done. There are nurses strikes around the country right now. And so we're seeing more uh, mobilization in the unions. Then, um, and I th just to push that one step further, it's in the context of broader mobilizations beyond the union movement. So we have the Fight for 15, we have Black Lives Matter, we have the fast food workers organizing, we have um, um, the new overtime rule by the Department of Labor, which gives more workers the right to, to overtime pay. Uh, we have many new laws uh, that set the minimum wage at $15 an hour, say in Seattle, in San Francisco, now in California, in the state of New York, and just yesterday in Washington, D.C. So there seems to be a kind of bubbling up of mobilization uh, around workers' rights, and this is part of that mobilization. Okay. Um, so what does all of this mean for Verizon? Ah, well, so I think Verizon obviously is not happy with 
having had to go through the strike. And I think it, um, it may have underestimated the, the strength of the union, the ability of the union to mobilize, and the ability of the union to get public support. And so Verizon kind of put its brand at risk a little bit in deciding to take the union on. And now what I think is it can restore that because the public, I think, uh, there's a broad view that the public feel that workers need uh, more stable jobs, they need uh, better pay. And so because the um, public views this uh, in this way, they don't want to see jobs offshored. You know, they, uh, the consumers, the, the customers of Verizon, um, don't want to see this, right? And so now the Verizon can say, well, we've done the right thing. We've backed off these, these um, uh, proposals. We understand they're not appropriate, and we're going to honor the union contract and, and support our workers. There's another piece of this, which is that, so I've done years of research, empirical research, on the performance of call centers and what human resource practices work or don't. And my research time and again has shown that if you have an experienced, skilled workforce, long-term, they are in the best position to provide the best customer service. And in turn, they also know how to package and sell more effectively. So the, un the, the unionized workforce is a real asset to the company. And even though they're paid more, they, they generate even more sales that are over and above what they are paid. And so it's really an important investment by the company to keep that experienced, skilled workforce because they really will de develop, de deliver um, good service. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, let me just say one other thing, which is that um, if, if a company outsources or offshores its um, call center work, then what it's essentially doing is giving that vendor access to all of its customers. And then that vendor won't treat Verizon customers any differently than AT&T customers or DirecTV customers or anything. So strategically, it's not in the best interest of a company like Verizon to actually outsource that work. Um, it's better to keep it in-house and, and use it strategically. And so in the end, I think the brand of Verizon is going to be stronger for the contract it's negotiated. Okay, some of our questions have come in. Um, please keep them coming, and I'll start with one from Susan. Why did Ver Verizon Wireless finally accept union organization at this time after many years of resistance, especially in light of outsourcing and offshoring in general? Uh, well... I'm not sure I can answer that question uh, completely, but I think it was just the dogged uh, persistence of the union. And the union has represents wireless workers in many other comp uh, companies, in, in, particularly in AT&T Wireless, where it represents some 50,000 workers. And over time, the, the union has worked very persistently to organize, to build the, the confidence and the trust of the workers, and finally it paid off. So I don't think there was anything magical about now except that um, they had persisted in this effort for so long, and possibly uh, going back to the environment in which workers are seeing the right, the, the fight for 15, the fast food workers standing up, and then they, they saying finally, well, it's our turn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, somewhat related to the first question is this one. The frequency of strikes at Verizon over the years would suggest some innovative strategies might be in order. What are management's initiatives in that regard? Uh, well, so I don't have, and unfortunately, I don't have like an inside um, uh, uh, avenue to, I haven't talked to any of the managers at Verizon, so I don't know what their thinking is. Um, the, the union and management have actually had an uneven um, history. So there were, in the uh, 80s, there were some really, really bitter strikes. 
And then there was a kind of coming together and an attempt to do labor management cooperation. And then that kind of broke down. And then there's been a history of kind of antagonism. But um, that is also true of other unions where there is almost a pendulum between you know, an antagonistic relationship and then there's an attempt to um, create cooperation, labor management cooperation. So I would hope that this strike has taught um, Verizon that it needs to move back in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, the CWA, uh, in particular, has a very strong history of doing effective labor management cooperation. And for example, the union has never uh, opposed such things as technological innovation, as long as we can uh, retrain and replace workers and, and find them new jobs, it hasn't been kind of opposed to that kind of innovation. So I think there are real opportunities now to, to move forward. Okay, great. Um, what do you think um, the impact will be for public sector employees? Um, will there be any implications? Um, do you think that the public sector might uh, learn some lessons from this private sector win-win? Well, um, first of all, the the, pro the public sector is very diverse, right? Mm -hmm. So the um, public sector unions at the federal level versus at the state level versus at local municipalities uh, versus teachers, for example, versus firefighters, they all have very different contracts and different um, uh, state laws and federal laws to abide by. And so there, it is a quite diverse um, a constituency. Um, I don't know that there is anything different that the public sector workers would learn compared to, say, other private sector unions. Um, I do think that the strategies have to be a bit different because um, the public sector workers are facing, um, you know, the um, as in Wisconsin, having their rights to collect the bargaining taken away. And so the, the uh, way to solve that, of course, is to build public support to change the law. And so they've got to really engage in a political strategy to make sure their collective bargaining rights are secure. And that has to be, I think, first and foremost on, on their agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're getting some excellent questions in here. Keep them coming. Thank you. Um, do you think that what happened with Verizon will trigger a resurgence in organizing activity in the private sector? I hope so. Um, I think that there are some, there are many unions that have been really trying to organize and that uh, one of the great difficulties is the way that our labor laws are enforced in this country. Um, and that is that even if you win a union election, um, it can take a very, very long time before you get a first contract and an employer has lots of ways of delaying that. And then even if that uh, contract, uh, if they get stalled, they, the employer can try to challenge uh, the election at the NLRB or in courts so that that in itself has created a real chilling effect on union organizing. Um, so I think that the strike will give uh, unions inspiration to be aggressive and mobilize on all fronts, and that will include organizing as all, and also representing their own workers effectively. Okay. Um, this question asks, do you see the union's success here translating to other ongoing negotiations such as those between CWA and OFS? Well, I hope so. I'm not, I actually don't have detailed information on those negotiations, so I'm hesitant to say much about it. Um, what I do think is that um, the CWA has over the years become very sophisticated in its organizing and its mobilizing. Essentially, the CWA treats its membership organizing as if it's an external organizing campaign. And they have built the capacity to mobilize its, their members to uh, really get out there in the public and 
explain their issues to the public. And just as they've done that in this fight, I think they will transfer those strategies to the other uh, campaign as well. So that tactic contributed to the union's success here. Um, uh, absolutely. Okay. The, the CWA and the IBW working together are very effective at really educating their members and um, treating them with dignity and respect and saying, this is your union and you need to be there mobilizing and organizing for your rights. Um, on the other side, there, there didn't appear to be a highly visible corporate campaign. So what's that all about? Um, I'm not, do you mean a corporate campaign, uh, a campaign by the corporation or do you mean? A, yes. Um, that's surprising. I don't have a good answer for that. Although, um, I'm not sure what what the message would have been. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's hard. Imagine a corporation saying, uh, going on uh, uh, into the public media and saying, "Well, we think we have the right to um, uh, undertake layoffs and send jobs to Mexico." <laughs> I mean, that's not a very good <laughs> message for the brand. <laughs> So, I'm not sure what the corporate campaign would have consisted of, okay. um, except I guess that you know workers are paid too much and and they they should uh, they shouldn't be paid as much. But um, those weren't the real issues. The issues were around job security, and most uh, working people I think really support efforts to provide job security to to people in this country. Okay. Um. Paula writes, for those unions that cannot go on strike, what do you suggest in terms of pushing back on the threat of outsourcing IT positions? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so I think if we look at the CWA campaign, um, we see that a lot of its effectiveness um, and not only the CWA but other campaigns in recent years have been in going to the public and making this, um, you know, they take the fight for 15 or the fast food workers, they don't have the right to strike with union protection, mm -hmm. right? They have the right to assemble and, and have collective action. Uh, but by having a visible campaign and taking it to the media and to the public and saying, you know, these are really legitimate issues. Um, and Outsourcing and offshoring doesn't hurt just us, it hurts all Americans, it hurts the American economy. I think that that message um, is a very powerful one and increasingly the way that um, you know, workers are gaining, um, are making gains are, are through these kind of public campaigns and public mobilizing uh, social movement kind of activism that uh, has meant, for example, the success in passing the minimum wage laws. Okay. Uh, Stephen asks, what are the main benefits Verizon derived from its prolonged negotiation? I think you mentioned a couple of them uh, earlier. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. If, if, you know, why did it hold out as long as it did? Again, this is from the outside because I haven't had any personal um, uh, exchanges with uh, uh, people in the company. But from other um, conflicts that I've seen, it, it seems to me that the company underestimated the ability of the union to uh, stay out on strike. So, okay, we can handle a strike for a week or two, so we're going to keep on holding out and maybe another week. And then I think it got quite um, uh, shocking, and that is where I think having the um, Department of Labor Secretary Tom Perez step in and try to bring the parties together was uh, very important. It sent a really important signal to both parties, and um, I think that uh, must have been important in in the changing the tone of the company. Were you personally surprised that Tom Perez stepped in? I, yes, N not, not, bec I think that um, because of who he is, 
um, we would say it, it would mean you know, the right thing that he would do and we would expect it. But it's surprising because no um, Secretary of Labor has stepped into a labor dis dispute for decades. I mean, I, I can't really remember the last time that a Secretary of Labor said, uh, let us uh, get involved and try to bring this to a solution. So that, I think, is a surprising mm -hmm. uh, uh, fact. Okay. Um, one viewer writes in, I saw the Verizon workers picketing and I gave them a friendly honk. What other actions did the union do to engage and educate the public? Um, you know, I, uh, I think that what they were doing in getting out in public, um, um, I'm not sure that many other things they did to get the public involved, except that there was a lot of media um, efforts to educate the public about why um, the strike was going on, um, so th through the media. But then uh, getting the workers out on the streets, I think, is a very effective way. So I'm not sure I know any more. I don't know whether there were things that the union was doing behind the scenes, um, but I think this getting, I mean, it's it's remarkable for workers to take off work and to go out in the streets and and try to meet other people in public, and that's what they did. So I'm not sure I can add much to that question, but I think this public uh, exposure of workers to other working people is very effective. Um, do you think the strike and, and what will probably be the upcoming approval of the contracts, we, we would expect they'd be approved, um, do you think it will be uh, good for morale on the Verizon side um, for, the, for the workers? Do you think it's going to be a big boost? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, because, look at their jobs are secure. I mean, it, 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 the difference between going to work knowing you have a secure job and that you then can turn your efforts to really providing good service uh, and, and good performance, that's really important as opposed to, you know, you come into work wondering if you're going to have a job the next day, well then you're, you lose focus, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, so I think that providing that kind of security and that win is going to be a real morale boost and that um, workers will respond uh, very positively. Okay. Um, another viewer asks, can you provide please some citations for the National Labor Relations Board decisions that make it more difficult for employers to replace strikers? I was a little confused by the PATCO example since it involved the FLRA and not the NLRB. Okay, so I'm, first of all, I'm not a labor lawyer, um, but the the PATCO use, uh, in, uh, the, the PATCO case is symbolic because Reagan essentially replaced all the PATCO workers with um, replacement workers that, uh, when the workers were on strike. And uh, there is a different law, it's a federal law, but it sent a signal to the private sector that you can do this too. And so the, um, from that point of view, the um, then the kind of rule became one of um, you know employers can use strike breakers as they will and they don't they don't have to um, say why um, historically the original NLRB uh, law regard on this point um, said that the employer had to um, provide a reason why. Um, the replacement was not illegal. In other words, why the repl replacement would be considered legal. And so the, the burden was on the employer. With this new NLRB ruling, the um, onus shifts back to the employer to um, make that justification. Um, and uh, I can dig up some citations, but I think the best thing is to go to the NLRB website and and um, look at the decision and see what um, those citations are. Okay, great. Um, two last questions and we'll wrap it up, but are you seeing uh, any evidence of the offshoring pendulum starting to swing back, that is, in particular, offshored IT jobs being 
brought back onshore? You know, I don't really. Um, I, so first of all, our, our data on outsourcing and offshoring is miserable. It, the, unfortunately, the government does not collect statistics in a way that we can even understand which IT jobs are in-house versus which have been outsourced to a vendor or a third party, let alone which ones are offshore. So the numbers are very murky. Um, occasionally we see kind of anecdotes that say, oh, you know, companies have decided to bring these jobs back um, because of better customer service or et cetera. But I think that uh, I think those stories are pretty anecdotal and are a very small scale. So I don't think we have the evidence to suggest that jobs are coming back, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe just wrote in um, and made note of the role that worker centers played in this uh, strike. And he says Tompkins County Workers Center mobilized members of the strike to take part uh, on a daily basis. So, you know, that's an interesting... That's absolutely right, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mention that because um, the worker centers um, have been um, really a major source of innovation and activism and mobilizing, and increasingly unions and worker centers are working together. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the recent SEIU National um, uh, Convention, there were discussions about how uh, members of worker centers might become, or the fast food camp, um, not the fast food, the, um, um, the, the worker centers could become members of SEIU over time. And I think there are a number of really creative ways that uh, the unions and worker centers are working together, and this is a great example. So thank you for, for mentioning mm -hmm. Um To what extent uh, do you think that the current political um, movement, uh, and they cite Bernie Sanders here in this email, has to do with the union's success and public support for workers? Well, certainly, um, you know, Bernie was out really early on uh, on this, on the picket line and in the rallies with CWA workers, and that was, um, uh, that was really uh, important and terrific. I it's hard to separate out, you know, who's doing what, but I think um, the Sanders um, campaign is an example of this bubbling up, and so there are di he's playing a, a critical role as a leader in really energizing uh, young people who want a better vision and who want more power and ability to change their lives. And he is um, feeding into other movements that have already been around. I mean, the Occupy Wall Street movement from a few years ago, and the worker centers, and the Fight for 15, and Black Lives Matter. And so we have, I think, pockets of mobilization that have been going on uh, for many years. And the, the mainstream media does not cover this. Um, you have to look on a kind of alternate alt news or alt labor news to find a lot of these struggles. And I think what's happening now is they're coming together and we're seeing the, the Sanders campaign uh, both benefit from what has been happening locally and then building that and taking it to a new mm -hmm. level. Well, thank you so much, Professor Bott. This has been great. Your insight yeah, is, you. is so welcome. And thank you to our viewers. We really appreciate your participation. Um, momentarily, you'll be able to find this discussion online at the same place where you checked in to view today's ILR online webcast. Um, again, thank you very much. This has been a production of the ILR School at Cornell University.